I had a, a rather interesting start uh, in that uh, uh, going to college really was not a, uh, an option for me. I think that uh, my family had some problems, and as I look back on it, I guess I was the problem. So uh, college wasn't going to make it, so I, I went to work uh, right after high school and uh, actually started a number of businesses, uh, and they were in the self-defense business. Because of that, I actually became an uh, undercover narcotics agent in the uh, 60s, in the uh, mid-60s and through about 70, which was an interesting career choice, and decided at uh, some point that uh, getting paid very little money to get shot at didn't make a lot of sense, so uh, I went into sales, which I think is uh, personally is one of the uh, uh, more noble uh, arts, if you will, and uh, gives you a lot of opportunity to meet a lot of different people and do a lot of different things. And from uh, sales, I actually worked for a, a company that's no longer in business uh, anymore, a company called A.B. Dick, selling copiers. And from that, I uh, got an idea with another fellow to develop a uh, sorting device for copiers and this would have been about 1971, 72. During that period of time, there really was only one copier on the market that had plain paper, and that was Xerox, and then the rest of the paper that was used by all the other machines was a coated paper, and so we actually developed a coated paper sorter. And in 1974, uh, we had developed the machine, showed it, and we were actually uh, sold a license to a large Japanese trading company called Itochu and uh, ended up selling them the license, uh, went over to Japan, uh, helped build the factory, taught them how to sell. Uh, we continued to develop the sorter in about 1996. Uh, the uh, Japanese company really was not doing very well with it, so we actually bought the license back and became a licensee of them, so kind of a reversal. Uh, and built the company back, uh, put all the money that they'd given us back in and, and more so. By 1979, we became the largest uh, developer uh, of OEM sorting devices for basically all the copiers in the world, Xerox, uh, uh, Canon, uh, Mitsubishi, uh, Royal. Uh, in fact, the only ones we did not build sorters for were uh, IBM and Kodak at the time. I sold out in 1980 and uh, thought I kind of knew everything. And <laughs> went and by 1983 managed to lose all the money that I made in the sorting business by going into all sorts of different businesses from restaurants to uh, high-tech things to uh, being my own venture capitalist, if you will. And so in 1983 I had to start all over again and, and ended up with what money I had left uh, buying a small uh, franchise company that had about 10 franchisees in about three years was able to build that company up to about 450 franchisees in 29 countries. Uh, in the process of doing that, we used to advertise in a magazine called Entrepreneur Magazine and uh, got to know them fairly well and uh, actually kind of like the Remington Razor guy uh, who liked his razor so much he bought the company, I liked the magazine so much I ended up buying the company and actually took over Entrepreneur in uh, uh, December of 1986. Uh, and uh, since then have concentrated on the magazine, sold the franchise company approximately 10 years ago. And uh, from uh, buying the magazine, which uh, had a circulation of under 30,000, it now is the third largest business magazine in the United States. And uh, we have, uh, we're also one of the largest book publishers in the United States. And, and uh, as of uh, now, we are the largest website with entrepreneur.com in the world with regards to small to medium-sized business averaging over uh, well over six million unique visitors on a monthly basis. It's been a good run. I don't know that much. I mean, being a police officer is a, is a whole, different, uh, whole different gig, if you will. Uh, what it probably taught me was uh, basically how to sell myself uh, and not get shot doing it. So the uh, uh, the the uh, group that I was with was, uh, in those days, was fairly intense, and uh, uh, it just gave me appreciation of, of uh, getting to know different types of people. And, and I mean, there were even people that uh, were on the opposite side of me during those days that I got to uh, actually liked quite a bit. Uh, but uh, you know, it was it was just a learning experience. Entrepreneur Media is, is a multifaceted uh, company. We, from the magazine side, uh, as I indicated, we're the third largest business magazine in, in the United States and probably in the world. 
Uh, we also have magazines in uh, Mexico, actually the largest uh, business magazine in Mexico, Entrepreneur de Mexico, uh, and that's a joint venture. We also have licenses of the magazine in different countries, Russia, China, uh, South Africa, the Philippines. We used to have one in Japan uh, and a number of other countries, Hungary, and uh, there's a couple other countries there. So we are growing throughout the world in the printed version. Now the printed version is a generic uh, magazine for that country. Uh, you just can't take an American magazine, translate it into their language and make it work. So uh, in each one of those countries they have a different editorial staff and, and, uh, and, and in some cases an ownership, a different ownership. The book business, uh, we uh, this year will uh, publish over 100 uh, paperback and hardcover books uh, dealing strictly in business, uh, small to medium-sized business. That may, actually makes us the number one book publisher in the uh, the book business, um, and uh, probably the number four or five, if you will, uh, of all book publishers. Been in that business for about seven years. Uh, made a big commitment to it, and that's a long-term, uh, uh, long-term commitment, and that that has uh, done very well in the last couple of years. Uh, we'll basically back down to about 55, 50 books a year so I don't kill my staff by trying to do over 100 books a year. Online uh, really has been changing uh, the basis of publishing. I think everybody has is, is recognized the newspapers and some of the other media having a great deal of uh, difficult time uh, since uh, the online uh, has, has come into being and certainly in the last four or five years. The Newsweek, the Time, the weekly magazines and the, the uh, semi-monthly magazines are having a great difficulty uh, and the rationale for those magazines in the past has been you want your news sooner and that's how you would get your news similar to a, a daily newspaper. Well now you can get your news every five seconds uh, if you want to online so it's created some difficulty for those type of magazines. Uh, people still like to you know read a magazine and, and they put it down they, they take it back so the uh, the amount of time they spend with it is a lot longer than they would online so we feel that we've got a uh, a good position even even with the growth of online. Having said that, uh, we uh, adopted the online, if you will. In fact, we were an early adopter. We actually started our online business, Entrepreneur.com, in 1994 and uh, have developed it over the years and to where we are today, uh, which is the world's largest uh, online site for medium to small size business. We're all over the world. Our average uh, unique visitors, uh, uh, well over six million a month. In fact, last month we, de we uh, delivered uh, 1.2 billion page views. And uh, the nice thing about that business and, and basically how we, of course, this is what this is about is business, how do you make money doing that, uh, is we sell advertising into that space. It is an advertising vehicle even though we do sell books and some other things online, the majority of our volume, if you will, for dollars is uh, the advertising space. In the books, uh, we probably, of the, the 105 I think we're putting out this year, uh, probably 40 of them are uh, books that are how-to books. You want to be a veterinarian, you want to be in the restaurant business, uh, they're, they're how-to books. And some of those books are written internally. Uh, the bulk of those books we actually go out and, and find an expert in the field and they, they write the book for us. We do books for Waisaki, uh, Rich Dad you know, uh, books. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, very uh, exciting authors that, that actually come to us to publish their books for them. Uh, Paul Tracy, who's a, a rather prolific uh, a writer of, of uh, motivational books and that type of thing, we've done quite a few books for him. Uh, we just uh, did a, a book, Masters of Success, that hit the uh, bestseller list for two weeks in a row. Uh, so we're, we're pretty excited about that. We go out and we find authors. Uh, at this point, a lot of authors find us because we are uh, so large in that business, so that, that works out pretty well. And uh, so that, that, that's pretty much the book business. The mission, if you will, uh, is to uh, help with, they've started it themselves, they've bought a franchise, they've bought somebody else's business or they already have a business, uh, is, is telling them what's new and also how to run it. Uh, when I first 
uh, purchased the magazine, uh, it was really about 95% of the book was strictly about um, uh, new businesses, you know, what was new and what was going on. And what we found was is that we're losing uh, a great deal of readership to people that, that would, uh, you know, they'd find that business and then they'd go someplace else because they, they needed to know how to run it. And so right now about 50% of the editorial that we do is how do you run it? What do you do after you've done one of these, you know, one of these things? Uh, what's really interesting is, is that uh, over almost 70% of our readership already own a business. So consequently, uh, I think we fulfilled that, uh, what we tried to do, with, which is, is to retain you know, subscribers and, and readership, which of course every magazine tries to do. I mean, it's, it's one thing to go out and get somebody to read it once or twice, but how do you bring them back? Uh, and to that end, we are the largest selling uh, uh, business magazine on the newsstand. Uh, we outsell Forbes, Fortune, Business Week on a monthly basis. Uh, even though some of those are semi-monthly. So I think we do a good job of, of uh, one, getting new readers, but also our retained readership is quite large. One of our advantages is simply the, the niche that we're in the small to medium size uh, marketplace. Uh, Forbes is in, in the big business. They talk about uh, uh, the GEs and the, uh, you know, the, the Airbuses and you know, Boeing and that type of thing. And, and they, uh, they don't really give practical information. They tell stories. Same thing would be true of Fortune. Uh, if you look at our magazine, it's, it's very practical. It's very usable information. We're, we're, not, we're not preaching, if you will. In other words, it's, it's, uh, there are, uh, every, every month there are uh, stories and interviews of, of people, what they're doing with their businesses. Now they're short. They're not, uh, we're not a vanity fair where we write a 30-page article. We, you know, we, we find that people just don't spend that much time doing that anymore. Uh, so our articles are short and concise and, and uh, you know, the, a, lo a long article for us would be a page, page and a half. So very concise, very practical. We're not preaching. Uh, this is, you know, how, you know, what, it, what is being done and, you know, kind of how it's being done. And so I, I think that gives us an advantage. But of course, we are the largest magazine in our niche, and that is our advantage. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not a, a number five book in a, in a five book category. We're the number one book in maybe a five book category. So uh, when we started, we were the number five, and now we're the number one. So I, I feel pretty good about that. An entrepreneur typically uh, uh, would start a company, gets it going, grows it to you know, whatever level of competence they feel they have, and then they'll sell it off. Because the skills of uh, then taking it to the next step and the next step and the next step are quite, quite different. You still have to have the entrepreneurial spirit, but you can't run the company exactly the same way. And after uh, uh, several, uh, as, as I look back, after several successes and several uh, Failures. I'm, I'm, I'm a perfect example of the uh, uh, the old saying that uh, uh, you know I've, I've had more failures than successes, but fortunately my successes have been bigger than my failures. And what I finally found out after getting hit in the head too many times uh, that you need to start bringing in people, and the old saying, bring in people that are smarter than you. And and that's pretty tough for an entrepreneur to do, uh, typically because. They're used to being, you know, running everything day to day and, and you know, being involved in anything. And, and as the company grows, you really can't do that. Uh, one, no one has all the skills. I don't care, you know, who it is. You, you just don't have all the skills. You can hire those skills. And as long as you hire good people, you know, smart people, and, and, and are not intimidated by those people, then I think that's the big difference. And I think that's where uh, the typical entrepreneur falls down, is, is they try and go too far without bringing people in and uh, I realized that about 10, 10, 12 years ago that I'd reached the level of my competence from the standpoint of day-to-day -day operations and, and I needed to bring somebody in so I brought a, a fellow in actually 14 years ago and part of the deal was uh, he actually was out of New York and that's all he'd done was in the magazine business. I'd never been in the magazine business before 
So I brought him in, and one of the one of the big conversations we had was uh, that I will step out of the day-to-day -day operations if you come in and run those. So I so what I do, you say, well, now what do you do? Uh, I I oversee. In my case, I see oversee the financials. I look at the financials on a daily basis, even when I'm not there. And uh, although I've got a chief financial officer and I've got all the layers there, it's run pretty much like a public company. Uh, but I look at the long-range planning, and everybody, uh, and this comes the entrepreneurial part. The people that I hire or that work work with me uh, are uh, have to be entrepreneurial uh, in the in the uh, guys of the, that the worst thing you can do working for my company anyway is not make a decision. Now everybody is charged with making a decisions up to certain levels. I mean you got your managers and your your executive VPs and everything else and and uh, so consequently they are charged with making decisions. Now if they make an incredibly wrong decision uh, we'll have a conversation about that. That decision will never happen again because if it does, then that's that's a whole other category. Uh, and I've and I found that's worked out worked out pretty well. I, I have never fired anybody, if you will, for making a wrong decision as long as it's not done too many times. And since you you everybody has their level of those decisions they can make. I mean, no one can make a decision that that will make or sink the company, uh, I'd have to be involved in that decision. But uh, all the way up, they, that's what they do, and it's worked out very well for us. That's always a challenge. Um, uh, it depends on what kind of a jerk you are, I guess, uh, or you aren't. Uh, in, in my case, um, uh, most of my top management people, actually most of my people have been with, with us for a long time. Uh, my chief operating officer has been with me for 14 years and uh, uh, even though with some ethnic differences and backgrounds and where we came from and, and you know most of my guys have got uh, education, I don't quite hold that against them too much, uh, but uh, we all are very different. But having said that, he's been with me for 14 years. My chief financial officer has been with me 10 years. My uh, uh, circulation individual has been with me for uh, eight years. Uh, you know, so I've, I've, retention has really not been a big problem. Uh, now you say, well, you know, does pay do that? Pay is only part of it, quite honestly. Uh, I would have to say that we we don't underpay, but I would have to say we also don't overpay. I think we pay a fair you know, a fair amount of money, and we have some bonus bonus built into profits and, and things like that. And uh, I think that you know that works out real well. And also just being fair to people, uh, we have had a number of people, and, and you know, your younger people tend to move and everything else. And quite honestly, I, I really don't have a problem with that. If I can get two or three years out of somebody that you know does a great job, and they say, hey. I got the entrepreneurial spirit. I want to go do my own thing. God bless. You know, I, I love it. You know, I've, you know, I, I think I've created a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, if you will, or enabled them, and and a lot of people have gone off and, and done very well in their own right. And I think that's great. Uh, we also have a lot of people that leave and then come back, and that's fine too. Uh, and and what they find is is that uh, we run a company that allows people to make decisions and uh, you know we don't punch a time clock uh, if, if you will people you know are expected to work you know eight hours a day if you will and and uh, that you know that's really not a problem but uh, there's no one beating them over the head or anything like that and and what a lot of people will find younger people and I hey I went through it too is that uh, you know, some large companies, well, not some, but a lot of large companies, uh, the, uh, the infighting, uh, the bureaucratic type of stuff that you've got to go through is just not worth maybe a few bucks more. You know, to walk across the street for, um, you know, a thousand, two thousand, maybe even three thousand a year more uh, to have to put up with some of the stuff that some, some people have, you know, that they do is really not worth it. So uh, we, we find we retain people. Uh, 
uh, it's always difficult. Um, starting a company is, and I've, I've, I've done it uh, probably too many times, um, you know, basically uh, several things have to happen. If, if, if you're married, that's a, that's a whole that's a whole another uh, gig, if you will. I mean, you you have to have uh, a uh, I guess we call them significant others now. You have to have a significant other that that really is going to go along with. Uh, in my case, uh, the first ten years I was married, I was gone seventy percent of the time uh, because I'd sold out to the Japanese and I was I was all over the world. Fortunately, uh, my wife uh, one had a good sense of humor. And two, uh, she worked, which I think is important, so that, that uh, she had her group of friends, if you will, while I was gone. Uh, and uh, she matured right along with me. I, I think what, what causes a lot of uh, breakups, if you will, if, and, and it's, you know, we waited 10 years to have kids. Now, that was for us because both of us really came from nothing. We really came from the wrong side of the tracks, actually me being gone, I'm traveling all over the world. I'm meeting different people that I never thought I'd meet, you know, meet before. Prior to that, I'd never been out of the state of California you know, before I started this company. And now I'm meeting people in Switzerland, I'm meeting Germany, I'm going to Japan, I'm going to Australia, I'm going all over. And of course all over the United States and, and learning things. And I'm maturing. I have to. Otherwise I'm not going to make it. Well, if, if, if your wife is sitting at home and she's got babies, you know, you know, she knows about babies, but your your interests become too diverse at that time. And I and I think that if if you look at a lot of marriages that don't make it, I think that's basically what happens. You just outgrow each other, you know. And all of a sudden, you've been married five, ten years, and you wake up. So who is this person? You know. And so I think that's a difficulty. So for me, having her work, I think was a good thing. And quite honestly, there were several times that if she hadn't have been, we wouldn't have been eating either. So. Uh, as far as financing goes, uh, initially the financing is typically your family. I didn't have a family. Uh, we actually, my partner and I, when we started the sorting business, we started the business on our, our American Express credit cards. And in those days, uh, the bank wouldn't let us any money. So uh, American Express, I think we each had about thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars $35,000 run up on our American Express cards. And fortunately, uh, the gal that used to call me was from New York, and the gal that used to call him from was Arizona to say we had to put some money in, in it. And you know, we're talking about the early 70s, and it was a little bit looser then. And um, you know, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars each at that point on our American Express cards was a lot of money. And that's how we started the company. I mean, by hook or by crook, and we did some things that, uh, um, looking back, you know, I'm not so sure that you know they're. I mean, we didn't cheat anybody, but it was it was you know it was borderline. Uh, you know, uh, you you do what you got to do. Uh, it worked out. I mean, uh, but there there were several times. Well, not more than several times that I've been worth. Uh, I've owed a lot less, a lot more than I've you know had. So technically, you're bankrupt, but you know you keep going. Uh, probably my biggest challenge is me. Um, the challenges have been varied uh, simply because of, uh, you know, when you start with nothing, uh, the first time you, you make something, you know, you do something that is, is pretty neat. Uh, a lot of the reasons you did it in business is because you're too dumb to know that you couldn't do it. And uh, quite honestly, uh, when I lost everything in, by 83, and of course that's when interest rates went up to 23% or 22%, and uh, one of the things I did get into was I was building condos and, and houses in three different countries of the world at the same time, which wasn't a real smart thing when uh, the interest rate thing hit. So when I started all over again, uh, the second time, I knew all the reasons why it wouldn't work, because you know because I'd already been through it. And so you basically, or at least for me anyway, you know you had to take a it was a big gut check that you know you're going to do this all over again and you have to put the rationale why you, all the reasons why you can't do it kind of put it down here and forget about that and try and get that enthusiasm and just I'm going to do it no matter what that you had the first time around and then the third time it happened that's when I think I lost all my hair uh, the third time is is a ridiculous uh, 
you know, tough way to go because now you, you know, you've, you've done it. But uh, uh, fortunately, I guess I have the, uh, you know, one, either the, uh, I'm, I'm too dumb to know any better or, uh, you know, a combination of that and just the hell with it, I'm going to do it. So uh, it's, 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 been a, uh, it's been a good run. It really has. Really, I've been very, very fortunate. Um, uh, you know, the first thing you think is is a language problem, and since I've been you know, uh, uh, doing business in Europe and Asia and really all over since the early 70s, uh, when a lot of people didn't speak English, uh, what I found was that that English, although having said that, English still is the business language, always was. So, was, fr from our standpoint, it it, it um, is, is very good. I think it makes us lazy because you know we don't typically learn other languages. Uh, I found that I had a little bit of an ear for languages when I was doing business in Germany and and uh, Japan an awful lot. I could I could catch about forty percent of what was going on. Couldn't speak it. I you know I, I could, but I just bastardized the language so bad that you know I was embarrassed to do it. So, you know, other than going to the bathroom and ordering a beer, you know, do whatever, I just kind of left it to that, just kind of listened to what was going on. But um, it really has not, it really has not been a problem for me. I, I know it's been a problem for, you know, other people. Uh, I, you know, I enjoy people. Um, uh, I think you, you asked me earlier with regards to, you know, I was an undercover narcotics agent and a cop. Uh, what I learned, I think, I, I surprisingly, I learned a tolerance, which you wouldn't think that kind of business would give you much of a tolerance. Uh, for me, it 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 did, uh, which is probably why I didn't remain a cop. Uh, but uh, anyway, it, it it taught me uh, an awful lot about different people, their personalities, and uh, even though I was just an awful student, I think I, I barely made it through high school. Uh, I I kind of became somewhat a history buff uh, from the standpoint that I was always curious as to why people thought different things, you know, growing up in different areas like the Japanese or the, or the Chinese or the Germans or the Belgians or whatever, why they thought things the way they did. And uh, from a business standpoint, um, I think this is very good because the first thing you realize is there's many ways to do things. And just because we do something here doesn't necessarily make it right there. And that's kind of the attitude I brought with me over over to Europe and, and over to Asia and, and I think that uh, uh, that helped me a great deal because I was just fascinated in, in you know by you know the culture you know and, and why people thought different ways and, and I think you can exploit that for your your own good now ex exploit not in the in the bad term of exploit but certainly get along and everything else I really have found very few people that I could not do business with there are a lot of people that I have chosen not to do business with but uh, uh, that that is based upon uh, if, if I, I've just and I've been able to do this in the last 10 15 years if I don't like somebody or if it's uh, not going to be fun or if there's anything that uh, is uh, uh, not right about it I just won't do it it's not worth it to me anyway I guess I should say that maybe they all do at my age, but uh, it's, it's taken a long way to get there. I read a lot, but I don't read management books. I don't read mentoring books. Uh, you know, someone asked me one time, well, who is your great mentor? Who did you, you uh, uh, look to, uh, you know, maybe follow your life by or what they did? And actually nobody. Uh, it's just been a self-learning experience. And, uh, uh, you know, and, that, and that's, that's probably just me really uh, I, I learn by experience and I've made probably every mistake there is to make uh, and uh, you know it's 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 worked out sometimes it didn't work out so I think that uh, you know for for me anyway uh, it's it's I, I enjoy all aspects of it I have found in the last 10 15 years I don't like the day-to-day -day operations of the business and I think um, once you reach a certain level you 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 tend to be you make decisions very quickly, and uh, sometimes that's maybe not the best thing to do. Uh, it may be better to um, just kind of wait and see how things play out 
and then then make the decision. So, uh, in in our business or my business, uh, my chief operating officer, he's kind of the, you know, he'll get this person and that person, and okay, why don't you you know work this out? And, you know, that's part of the day to day. Uh, quite honestly, if it was me, and uh, the way we we play it is is that you know if I come in, then a decision is going to be made immediately, right or wrong. You know, hopefully I make it the right way, but. Uh, I, uh, I, I tend to make decisions very quickly. Probably the day-to-day. -day. Uh, financial is not that much, you know, is, is not much of a challenge only from the standpoint that we're in such good shape. <laughs> it, it has been a challenge. Uh, and, you know, then, then you, you, take, you take care of it. But, but even there, I, I don't, you know, I don't sit there and add things up and you know uh, you know run the books I've got a chief financial officer to do that and everything else I, I still when I'm in the office I still sign it's a two-party check and I still sign the check which gives me a, a great way of seeing the day-to-day -day operations and I think everybody should do that because you since you can't be involved in anything when you sign the checks you are involved because you know what's going on basically at my position at this time I, I walk around and talk to people in the beginning yeah you're involved in everything uh, so uh, as, as, we, as we discussed earlier, uh, the role of the entrepreneur changes and I am probably less of an entrepreneur today than I was 10 years ago. Only because, not mentally, but in how I run the company. You can't run a company my size, you know, being the, the consummate entrepreneur. You have to put on too many hats. Quite honestly, I don't work that hard right now. <laughs> you know, that's a good thing. I've hired the people and and everything else. I mean, you know, realistically, if you think about it, uh, uh, you know, if you've done your job correctly, you, you basically try and work yourself out of a job. Uh, and if you get to a certain size, which I've been very very fortunate in this particular situation to get of a size that I can hire some, like I said, people that are, that are smarter than I am in their their particular position. Um, I don't think any of them have ever had to make a paycheck, but uh, or you know, and uh, that's a whole other story where you know you basically an entrepreneur, the employees get paid before the uh, the owner does, and, and uh, you know a lot of management, if you will, don't ever have that feeling, right or wrong, but you know it, it gives you a, a, a bigger insight. But uh, uh, realistically, um, you know, I, to my way of thinking. You've done your job when you worked yourself out of a job. And so, quite honestly, if I never showed up again in my company, it would run just fine. And I've got management. I've, I've, what I've done is I've forced management to make sure that they have somebody in there that can replace them, too. Sometimes that's difficult. But, you know, basically, uh, there's really nobody in, in my company that if they disappeared the next day, uh, that it would really affect the company all that much. Again, because the way we've set it up, and I've got some very powerful people there, there really isn't any decisions other than um, a, a legal issue. Uh, and I've got in-house counsel also, so I'm very fortunate from that standpoint. Uh, but uh, long-range uh, commitments, if you will, uh, contractual commitments and that type of thing, then I want to be aware of them. Uh, now, uh, having, having said that, um, I've found that there are very few times that I have to override much of anything simply because I think most of the people that have been around me long enough, they kind of know how I think and, you know, maybe it's my will over theirs and they kind of think the same way I do, you know. But uh, there's been, really been very few times then that I've really said, no, we're not, we're not going to do that and, you know, here are the reasons why. So I think, uh, uh, you know, that, again, that's, that's a process of they know how I think. They, they've all got the company's well-being as part of their DNA, and they're, they're not gonna, really not going to do anything that's going to screw it up, or at least try not to. So um, it works out pretty well. I don't know there's any secrets. Just treat you know, treat your customer how you'd like to be treated yourself. Uh, don't lie. You know, if you've got a problem, tell them. I've got a problem. There's been times, uh, you know, in the 
the 21 years I've owned the magazine, uh, we've had some horrible financial times, if you will. I mean, the magazine business been down, been up. I had partners. I had to buy the partners out. I, you know, every every imaginable problem, uh, imagined problem that you could have, I've probably had. And in some cases, it required, uh, if you will, letting people that were selling to me, and in turn, I had receivables with them to let them know what was going on. I was going to be a little later whatever, but I've always, I've always been firmly believed in letting, you know, up to a point, letting them know what's going on, I'm going to take care of it. And the same is true with customers. I mean, it, it kind of goes along with that. I mean, if, if we have a customer that uh, we have a problem with, I, off the top of my head, I can't think what it would be at this point, but uh, we would be very upfront with them and say, look, we've got a problem, well, here's how we're going to correct it. And uh, I think if you don't do that, it can get out of hand. And if it gets out of hand, then all of a sudden maybe you got legal people involved and, and some other stuff, and, and it gets a little crazy. Now, there are some situations that, you know, it, it, uh, it ramps up, and, you know, no matter how forthright you're, you are or whatever, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, end up in, you know, I guess if you think about problems, a legal problem is probably the ultimate, you know, where it gets to, which uh, is, is stupid. All it does is make the lawyers money. But sometimes you can't help it. Uh, you try and, you know, you just get on with it, deal with it, move on. In the last four years, yes, uh, the Internet side of our business is actually bigger than the print side. Uh, that's caused some problems with my editor-in-chief and a few other people on the editorial side that, you know, uh, up, up to up to four or five years ago in the magazine business, the, the uh, editorial side of a magazine was king. You know, they, they were the, the top dogs in that, that area. And in all magazines, that's really, really changed. If it hasn't changed, then I would suggest to you that those magazines are in a lot of trouble uh, because the online side has become so large and so pervasive that um, I don't think magazines in general will survive if they don't have a very large online component. And it's surprising the number of large publishers, and, and publishing it really is a New York business. We're one of the few out here in California. In fact, we're one of the largest in the western part of the United States. Uh, New York doesn't, still doesn't think California exists or the west coast exists. But um, uh, a number of the large publishers are having a, a very difficult time because of the bureaucracy and just because of the old boy network or old girl network, we'll have to throw in that. Uh, back there, uh, they, they don't want to change. And, uh, you know, the world, is, the world has changed. And so consequently, being out here, we don't follow the standard thinking in New York, and, and we've benefited uh, from that. We actually have a separate editorial department online, and it reacts. It's surprising. It reacts. It has to faster. It reacts on a you know, minute by minute, well, maybe not minute by minute, but certainly a daily basis where a magazine, when you put a magazine together, uh, you've already written the magazine for four or five months out. Where, you know, online, it's, it's just a constant thing. And, and so it's, it's a different mentality and, and uh, um, a lot of older people don't get it. And I guess I'm one of those older people, so maybe I get it. Four or five years ago, it was you know a lot of phone calls and writing it out, and then having a secretary you know correct my spelling and and all that type of thing. Cause I, that's another thing I never learned how to do is spell. But uh, you know everything is done by email now, and with spell check, it's great. I have a uh, second home, and and the computer I have there for some reason didn't have spell check in it, and I just went about nuts. So I had to I call my IT guy. I said, oh, you gotta you gotta help me. I've been look like an idiot, but. Um, in the last four years, if I have written five letters, it's a lot. Everything is done by email, um, and and it's great. Um, you know, in, in the old days, I remember. You know, you you spent a half hour trying to figure out how to open up a letter. Gee, you know, I hope your kids are nice and this is good, and you know, on and on and on. And now it's you know, yes, no. I've even got a BlackBerry, you know, and so I don't carry a computer with me when I travel. When I travel quite a bit. I have a phone that's got a BlackBerry in it, 
and it's a worldwide phone, and, and it's yes, no, yeah, okay. Uh, more than three or four sentences is, 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 is really a lot in an email, and, and everybody's doing it, and so it's great. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. It's not so great for the secretarial profession, but those secretaries have now become assistants and they do a lot of other things. So it, it's made us all, I think, more efficient. I've you know, had people that uh, we, we do some ratings, if you will, uh, in the magazine. Uh, uh, once a year we have a, what's called a Franchise 500. It's a listing of all franchises that's become the Bible of the industry. And, some people don't like their ratings, so they'll call up if they know me or whatever, and you know, they, they start to, uh, if, if they start to get agitated, then the conversation we have is very short. I said, you know, if you, if you want to yell at me or, you know, if you don't want to have a civil conversation, then I'll just hang up right now. And so that doesn't happen anymore. And the rating is, is not subjective at all. It's, it's very objective. They have to send a number attached to each one, if you will, I guess. And our editorial department runs that, and I have purposely never asked them what that was. So when somebody calls me and raises hell with me, if you will, I say, look, guys, I said, since you know me, I will take this, I'll give it to them. And I said, I don't even know what the rating thing is. You know, you're going to get what you're going to deserve, and, and that's all I can say. So from that standpoint, there is a, a state and church type of a, a thing, and, and that's, that's, that's done, I've, I've done well by that and everybody accepts that. I've uh, been fortunate in that, uh, and I guess it goes back to my old uh, undercover days, I, I really don't take anything home with me. Um, at least I try not to. So I'm not one that stays awake at night and you know uh, does that. I sleep, usually sleep fairly well, other than my shoulder operation a couple days ago. But, uh, 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 so, uh, you know, I, I, I try not to take things home. I don't really discuss all that much at home. I mean, if somebody asks me a question, yeah, you know, we do it. When my kids were still at, in home, they always knew when there was a, a problem. We used to talk about it, you know, and, and everything else. And I think um, uh, it, it, it helped them in their business life, and they're, they're doing very well. They kind of knew if, if we were in trouble or if we were, you know, I've been sued or, you know, something had happened or whatever. and, and uh, uh, but other than that, uh, I, I, right now I play golf. I used to race cars professionally for about uh, 18 years. I, when I was 35, 36, I was always interested in cars and decided that I didn't want to be in my 50s saying I woulda, coulda, shoulda. I started racing, you know, amateur and then uh, uh, got involved with the factory Lotus team and raced for them for about three years and the Pontiac team and the Chevy team. and I started my own race team in the Trans Am series, raced in the Long Beach Grand Prix, all the big races, Daytona, Sebring, all over, which was great. And it was, you know, fortunately I had a business. I didn't quit my day job. And a uh, very expensive uh, thing to do. And, and unfortunately the money that I won never even came close. But uh, uh, that's a good thing. The bad thing is two shoulder operations, a back operation, and a few other things, you know, from banging too many walls at times and some other things. But somebody asked me the other day whether I would have done anything different. And I said, other than, you know, I think if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd taken better care of myself. But uh, then again, I don't think I've changed anything. So it's been a good run. So I, you know, I used to hunt a lot. Uh, I still ski. Uh, I still ski very, you know, we got, fortunately I have a home up in Park City, Utah. And so I still, the only thing I don't do is do bumps and I don't jump off of things, but I still ski through the trees and, and everything else, so I'm still pretty active. Staying married as long as I have. Uh, I think I've been married 38 years. I've got two, uh, two boys. They grew up here in Newport Beach, which is kind of never, never land. Certainly it's nothing that I grew up in. And uh, the big thing was, you know, how do you give them a, a sense of uh, uh, worth and, you know, got to go out and work because there's, there's a lot of privileged people here and you know other places and and I think that uh, probably my wife and myself's greatest achievement has is, is been uh, they've both got very good hearts and a very extremely good work ethic and I think if you can give your kids that we've been married 38 years now I never said it would last and uh, so uh, the boys are uh, you know they're they're now uh, 
a grandparent. They both have boys that are two years old, and and so I think their biggest challenge is going to be, you know, seeing if they can, you know, grow them up so that they've got a good heart and a good work ethic, and, and that's I think that's about all you can do, and uh, I think we've accomplished that. I suspect there is, but you know, there's really no reason to think about it. Uh, at least in my, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? You, maybe I could have tried to get more education, but who knows? That might have screwed me up. You know, I wouldn't be like I am. So, I, you know, I, I don't think you can go back. Um, are, are there some things that I've done that maybe I'm not all that proud of? Yeah, I suppose. Uh, or I would have done different. Yeah, but who cares? You know, I am what I am, and. Yeah, I've always uh, subscribed to the thing. If you if you like me, great. If you don't, that's fine. You know, just you know, here here I am. Take it, take it or leave it. An MBA, to my way of thinking, um, is is great, but don't take yourself too serious. And I think a lot of MBAs think they know a whole lot when they come out. What they know is mostly what they read out of books, or maybe you know maybe they're going to learn something out of this interview. I'm not sure, but uh, it, it's all practical knowledge. And um, you got your MBA, that's great. Some you know some professions uh, like the investment community and and some of the other communities they require that, and that's that's certainly good. But um, I don't think I would ever hire an MBA until they went out and got kicked around a little bit and learned out what the real world was, quite honestly. Uh, they're obviously very smart people, but sometimes smart people aren't very practical. And business is about being practical, not necessarily being all that brilliant. I'm a perfect example of that, I think. But, uh, you know, you can always hire s smart people. You can always, you know, you can, you can hire a good CPA. You can hire, you know, people. Uh, what's more difficult is finding a good practical individual that can do you know a lot of things and is not afraid to do things and, and uh, uh, that that's not that's something you don't learn out of books you, you don't really find in books you don't find from necessarily having an MBA so I'm, I'm kind of dancing around here but uh, uh, that's really kind of how I feel Well, that's two different things. Okay, uh, starting your own company is a whole different deal as far as uh, uh, going to work for somebody else. I would suggest to anybody go to work for somebody else uh, first, and the reason being is you, you know theoretically, if if you get the right position. Now, if if all you're doing is pushing papers or or uh, uh, doing that, you're you're not really going to get that much of a you know that much of an education. I think when I started the you know this conversation with you, uh, I said you know one of the one of the best professions in the world is being in sales, and the reason for that is is that one you're going to get kicked around, people are going to say no, and you're going to meet a lot of different people, and you're going to learn from those people. When I got out of being a cop, I I knew one way of thinking. You know, if, you know you give me too much trouble, I'll either hit you or shoot you. That doesn't work very well in the private world. But you go out and sell, and if we, you know, we talked earlier about, uh, I was very fortunate, I traveled all over the world, I met different people, I learned how they thought and why they did things. And that helped me kind of mold myself. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a composite of a lot of people that I've met, and some good, some bad, I guess. But, uh, I think that, that uh, sales is great for that. Sitting behind a desk pushing papers, you're not going to learn a lot. You really aren't. Uh, so uh, working for somebody else, yeah, that's great, as long as it's in the, you know, in the right thing. And everybody's not cut out to be an entrepreneur. You know, everybody's not cut out to own their own business and run their own business. And, and that's fine. I mean, you can, you can uh, if, if making a lot of money is uh, what you're about, you can make a lot of money working for somebody else. You can't make as much money typically uh, as owning your own company and doing it that way. I mean, typically you do, although I think I've seen some things in the papers in the last couple of years. Some of the, these managers are making some pretty <laughs> huge amounts of money for 
not from my way of thinking, not doing a whole lot, but that's a whole other story. But you know, it really depends on on what you know what you're interested in and 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 what you want to do. But uh, go out and get some experience. You got to get kicked around. And if you ever think that you don't have to pay your dues, then you, you're pretty stupid uh, because you do. You got to get kicked around. You got to learn different things. You know, you you don't come out out of college, you're really not all that smart. You learned a lot in books and that's about it. So go out and pay your dues and then you're going to be ready.